All right, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome. Good to see smiling faces again. Hope everybody's doing well. So let's call the meeting to order. Uh, good to see some faces we haven't seen in a while, Mr. Joya. I know you were. I just said faces we haven't seen. <laughs> Welcome. I hope everyone's doing good. Um, so we have a quorum and uh, currently all alternates can vote. So if you're an alternate, you can vote today. Uh, um, so let me start off by reading the purpose statement. Uh, that my name is Jim Godfrey, chair of the Citizen Advisory Committee. And the purpose statement uh, is that the primary objective of the CAC is to ensure the capital maintenance and public transportation projects and programs approved by the voters at November 2nd, 2004, November 6, 2012, and November 7th, 2017 ballot measures are accomplished with PPRTA funds. This committee reports directly to the PPRT Board of Directors. All right. Do I have a motion uh, to approve the agenda or any additions to it or changes? So moved, so moved for approval, Tony. Uh, second. Second. And for those online, um, just a thought came to mind, make sure you mention your name if you make a motion or second something so we can record it. Um, so Larry was a second on the, the approval of the agenda. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, hearing none, agenda's approved. <clears throat> um, do we have any public comment for items not on the agenda? First, by any members of the committee? Not seeing any, anyone in the audience have any comments for items not on the agenda? Anybody online? Not seeing one? Okay, great, thank you. Um, approval of the minutes from our previous meeting. Do I have a motion for the February 1st meeting? Second. Okay, second. Greg. All right, great. Thank we have first and second. Uh, any discussion? No changes. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Lisa, financial bird. All right. Lisa Corey, the finance manager for the PPRTA. So the month I'm reporting is December, which closes out our year. Um, we were below the amended budget by $473,533. However, we did meet our budget. Um, the amended budget was $456 million, and we closed the year with $156,206,057. So Yeah. Hey, don't all cheer at once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, December went down according to projections, but we were above last year. So, yeah, in terms of budget. So, yeah, it was 396,152 over last year, December last year. Yeah. So, so. well, let's just hope that. Uh, that it continues and, and people get, I think there's some adjustment period going on between all the pandemic extra money that everybody had and, and reality, and it'll, le it'll level back out again, I'm soon, but uh, I think reality is settling in and don't have that extra money sitting around. <clears throat> I noticed that something about new car sales were up uh, one month here recently um and, and it seems there's a lot of unexpired license plates riding around on cars i don't know how dmv is so far behind but there's a whole bunch of them out there so anyway good any questions for lisa um i i would just like to make one comment about um rta1 projects and the only one that i see that we really have there's a couple from the county, uh, Meridian, and uh, then of course, uh, Mark Shuffle on both ends, for, and then Mark Shuffle for the city. Um, are there any issues headed down those other than the, the effort you're proposing on Mark Shuffle now? That'll use up the rest of that money, right? I, that's the correct. And when we talk about the line item transfer, I'm gonna talk about how these are the remaining funds 
um, now that the city and county have completed our obligations under RTA 1, and we're going to apply all that RTA 1 money to the Mark Shuffle Road efforts where we're going to be working on. Okay, yeah, because that's what, I mean, that was kind of the agreement going into RTA 2 that that money would roll over. Meridian Road, any issues with that, Josh? Uh, no, no, not really. Okay. I mean, other than having basically three projects and three funding sources kind of spread out. So, but um, no, not really. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, the reason I'm asking the question or bringing it up is that, you know, as we're, we're nearing, we're going into the nine year point and heading into 10 here shortly, and we're still haven't closed out one, so to speak. So um, just needed to think about that from a public perspective in terms of we're getting ready to go into three and we haven't finished one and there's been a 10 year gap in there. So, uh, well, the Meridian project's been I mean, substantially complete for about a year now. So there's there's been some very insignificant, very minor um, warranty issues and um, changing in criteria and working with the city to make okay. sure that, yeah. So very minor stuff. Okay. And one thing I want to add too on that RTA one account, um, we are still receiving developer contributions to it. And in fact, I think uh, PPRT just recently received one in the last week or two. So even if I encumber all those dollars today and start spending those down, you may see money pop back up in that account, even though we think we're done. So Keep just it. want to, all fairness, want to put that out there. Keep it coming. <laughs> yes. The, Knock on doors. In fact, I'm just going to be putting a change jar out there on the side of the road. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, yes, sir. Would it be worth uh, Gail uh, informing the new CAC members uh, about developer money? I would be happy to. So, uh, in some cases, and, and Rick, I may actually even help ask you to help me out with the board policy on cost recovery. So, in some cases, where we're going through and doing PPRTA projects. Um, one of two things can happen where we're going to get developer contributions either up front before the project starts or after the fact um, once the project's complete. Um, in some cases, when we know development's coming in, they have a contribution that's required. It's collected typically with their um, either an annexation agreement or some kind of fees when they um, record their plat. And those typically get held in... Um, most often they get held in the city's... In my case, get held in the city's general fund. Um, sometimes in the past, and you'll have this case on Mark Shuffle, because the project went through, we get developer contributions, and that's what happens on the backside, and we refer to it as cost recovery. That's either, again, written into an annexation agreement when a development is, or a development agreement or annexation agreement when the development is occurring, or we as a city actually file, um, essentially, uh, it's not a lien, but uh, file something with that property once it develops that they have to pay their portion at share. And in fact, in, it's probably going to be in May. I'm going to bring, I think I have a responsibility report that when the new one, new situations like that happen, uh, we have a development that's, that's starting to emerge adjacent to Black Forest Road, that their requirement as part of the development is going to be turning, putting dedicated turn lanes in. But they're far farther behind than our construction project. So what we're going to be doing, assuming I get this agreement finalized with this developer, is that we will put that turn lane in with the Black Forest Road project and file a cost recovery agreement. And I would anticipate getting payments in the other, either three or four increments to, to basically replenish PPRTA for the cost they incurred um, for doing that in conjunction with our bigger project. So those, those are the things. But these are primarily for developer driven requirements, correct? Yes, absolutely. They are for developer driven requirements. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. All right, uh, item number six, uh, 6A, City of Colorado Springs Capital Transportation Project. Okay, Gail Sertum with City of Colorado Springs. Um, so I've got a line item transfer request um, in your memo and I'm gonna be walking through that with you. Um, I'm actually gonna start with the easier one first, which is the second bullet on your memo that um, we are still in the process of closing out the Platte Avenue uh, bridge replacement project. Um, I've got $240,000 um, available. Um, I know that my El Paso 
County or my El Paso bridge project is going to need some additional funding. So I want to transfer the $240,000 from the Clyde Avenue project to the El Paso project to uh, get that funded. And we're close to being able to go out to bid for that project. Um, and then the, the other part of this line item transfer is really shifting dollars that I have programmed for the two South Academy projects and the Circle Drive projects that are currently programmed in 2023 and funding those requirements in 2024 and taking the monies that are freed up in 2023 and making them available for um, the Mark Shuffle Road project through the traffic programs. So if you look, if you're able to look at the table um, in that area, you'll see that I'm gonna take um, for the South phase of the Academy project, I'm really taking $5 million out putting $2 million actually in the, the North phase because it needs it to be fully funded just to kind of balance it out. It's one construction contract. Um, the other $3 million want to put in roadway safety and traffic operations, again, intended for the purpose of funding Mark Shuffle Road construction. Um, that $5 million will be, is already programmed to be replenished um, in my 2024 CIP plan, which is also attached with that memo. I'm um, in the Circle Drive bridge replacement projects. And we had to want to take $5 million out of 23, make that available in the roadway safety and traffic operations for the purpose of Mark Shuffle Road, and then backfill those funds in 2024, as again shown on the CIP. Um, I mentioned the uh, transfer in the $240,000 between the Platte Avenue Bridge to the uh, El Paso uh, Bridge over Fountain Creek. And then um, kind of getting to what you were asking or talking about, Mr. Godfrey, there are two county projects that they are they are done with that were RTA ones, um, the Mark Shuffle Road, the Mesa to State Highway 94, and the Mark Shuffle Road, Peterson Air Force Base to Black Forest Road. Um, taking both those sums of money and again, transferring to the city's RTA one project or that still exists for Mark Shuffle Road from Peterson Air Force Base to Black Forest Road, which is why Josh has copied on a memo for the city of Colorado Springs. Um, and so that's really, again, meant to get those fundings available to help with Mark Shuffle Road. So that's the overall, the line item transfer. Uh, the next uh, piece of the memo that I included in your packet really shows the compilation of funding sources putting together to fund these Mark Shuffle Road improvements. And this does not include monies that we've already committed to that project. These are the monies that are either existing in either existing RTA accounts or as we make these line item transfers or um, and the county has a, a, a maintenance uh, line item in their budget and uh, the city has had some still has some general fund monies available to that from a, another developer contribution that I've mentioned in the previous meetings. So you can see that this this line item transfer for the purpose of Mark Shuffle Road going to have a, about $20.8 million still able to be applied towards that project. And the last part of that memo, and I know it's, it looks to me like it's small print on this memo, so I apologize if it's hard for you to read, but really what this did, it was show you that I'm still able to fund and fulfill the commitments um, for the PPRTA A-list projects with making these adjustments um, to put monies in these traffic programs for Mark Shuffle Road project. Um, and how I was able to do that, I, I've been showing, if you read my quarterly reports, that I'm going to have some contingency or things to apply to the B list in the future. This is really using that contingency that would I have at the end of the program for the purpose of addressing a safety issue we have today on Mark Shuffle Road. So it's a lot of information in one memo. I'm trying to give you an overview. I'm, I'm sure there's hard questions, and I'd be happy to try to answer those at this point. Just one that I'm going to anticipate a particular board member asking is that on the South or the Academy Boulevard projects is that it won't affect the end run of that project. It's just moving it from one year to another. Yeah, that's correct. And in, in particular for the Academy projects, and they're out there doing construction um, as today, right? The um, It's just with the cash flow, we don't need the additional funding until 24 to fund it. So it makes sense to leverage cash in 23 to address another safety problem and still completely fund that project in 24. But that is going to be challenging. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> Gail? Yes, sir. Um, have a question for you and Josh both. Um, 
third item down, fourth item down, El Paso County maintenance, 2020, committed for maintenance at lower water crossing north of Carefree. Mm -hmm. Now, is that, let's see, how can I say this? That's not really for maintenance, is it? Is it really for funding? Because the, the long range projection is to put a bridge there. So is that money really, that million and a half, really dedicated for building the bridge that goes across there? Ultimately, that's how it's gonna be applied, yes. Um, the county, and this is where, unfortunately, neither Josh nor I have the, a lot of the history, but we were able to get it from former staff that um, there was a longer term maintenance issue that the county had been programming that money for, I think as back as 17, 17, 18, if you go back and look at some of the minutes um, for that issue, but because we were transferring Mark Shuffle Road over to the city and we were looking, we knew we needed to address a bigger issue. It made sense to apply that same money in a different way to serve the problem and a more permanent solution. So yes, there would be a bridge at that location. So, but this is just funding that was really committed towards addressing that issue. So it will supplement the rest of the funds. Or they so go, it's not really maintenance per se, it's actually committed toward, and like right. you say, this it, has been on the books for, like you yeah. say, 17, 18, something right. like we, that. We include the word maintenance because it's maintenance funding or a portion of the 35% of the county's 35% for maintenance funding. And that's what they've been carrying in their budget even before Josh. Um, was like it's a county engineer. Yeah, that's where it comes off that hill, goes down in that low dip, and you got that subdivision. Weren't they going to put a box culvert or something in there? To, to... It is going to be a box culvert that will be going in that location. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the only concern I've got, Gail, and and not not in what you're doing and the need for what needs to be done out there because that that nine years overdue in my opinion in terms of trying to fix that that road the only concern i've got is we're just adding 20 million dollars to a program fund mm -hmm. and um <clears throat> i want to protect the integrity of the thought around programs funds and the fact that when you do the budget, you guys have got a list of proposed projects that you propose spending that allotted amount on. And, and now we're, we're kind of using one of those program funds to accomplish what many would argue should have been an A-list project. And while it, it is roadway safety and traffic ops, and it is intersection safety and all that, because those, the instances, if you look at the police blogs at barns and all that stuff, it's, it's obvious that it's something needs to be done out there. But I'm just concerned that we make sure that we've got our story right when somebody on the board or elsewhere questions that we have such a large project as part of program funds, which is uncharacteristic of what program funds have typically been used for. That's my only concern. And, and we actually share your same um, concern, which is why we've been trying to demonstrate specifically what issue it's um, going to be applied for. So it can be accounted towards that, you know, towards that project. And we've been building up these funds through some budget amendments since 2021, um, which at the time was when at least the city's board members approached uh, Travis Easton and myself and said, we've got a major problem out here. Can you come up with a way to address this issue? So I think that we have um, the political support to address this issue and, 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 and understanding and support for use of the programs in this fashion. But you're right, it's important to continue our accountability and our transparency on how they're being used in addressing the specific issues they're designed for uh, as defined within our budget documents and quarterly reports. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to get that out there um, just because it's such a large amount and there's a large carryover in some of these programs every year to build up to, these, to this large amount. And I just wanted to make sure that that was out there, particularly for some of the newer members that in terms of what 
those program funds were intended and, and the purpose, if you will. So just wanted to throw that out there. So thank you for uh, acknowledging that. Good. Yeah. Good question. Um, <clears throat> if I want to ask on the north section of Academy, is that is that all a high cost because of the bridge? It, and the I, north section of Academy isn't that long, but it seems very expensive. And I was wondering, is it the bridge that's costing so much? Uh, I I don't know that I know the, the specific an answer to that question. I do. When I think when we allocated the construction costs, because we ended up bidding both packages at the same time, that when we um, did the budget, we um, didn't really needed to put more funding towards the the uh, the north phase than we did the south phase, and so we're shifting that through this line item transfer. Uh, but it's it's the bid costs that we've had, and it's pretty consistent with the pricing we've seen in other projects. Well, I I just thought that I had the perception that. The south end of Academy was going to be a lot more expensive because of the landfill and everything. And the north end seems to be sucking up money. And I and I'm driving that all the time from Bijou to airport isn't all that bad compared to from airport to uh, Melton uh, Proby. Uh -huh. So I was just wondering where the money for the north end was was required. Well, that, that I know that there are a lot of drainage re improvements that, and plus they're having to rebuild the whole pavement like they would on the south phase as well. And they also have a lot of um, shallow groundwater on that north segment. So there's, um, but I, the costs are relatively the same though on a, a per lane mile basis. And I could uh, get that for you if you're kind of curious what the per lane mile cost is on those projects. If you're yeah, interested. Just get that over if you would please. Yeah. Thank you. All right, any uh, any questions or comments on line item transfers? It's not listed as a, um, oh, yes, there is. Um, sorry, noted. Yes, it is. It is a separate line item. Uh, <clears throat> read the whole sentence, yeah. Um, so any further discussion or questions on the city's request for line item transfers? Anybody online? Okay, not seeing one. Do I have a motion to approve, Tony? I uh, move approval of the city's request. Uh, Rick Hoover, second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passed. Okay. Uh, item 6B. City projects. Uh Gail Servant, City of Colorado Springs. Uh, today we have 11 contracts for your consideration. Um, the first one is actually going to be addressing that Mark Shelper Road improvements. And I and I have to apologize. I recognize as I was preparing for this meeting, and thankfully Rich also recognizes the same thing that I I put the wrong numbers on the memo and then on the contract log and this. So I'm going to be correcting those verbally and then providing a corrected update to Rick for inclusion with the board's packet. So um the the total um Costs that I'm proposing for the contract amount uh, for PPRTA costs would be in two million six hundred twenty-four thousand two hundred thirteen dollars and six cents, with the other coming from, uh, which is the city's general fund based on some developer contributions from the past, and nine hundred eighty-one thousand eight hundred eighteen dollars. Um, this purpose of this contract would be to do our second contract award with Kramer North America, who was selected for our CMCG contract for this uh, project. Um, and this would be funding uh, what we were referring to as pro uh, package zero. Package zero is covering the water line relocation that needs to happen there in proximity to the, the Barnes and Mark Shuffle intersection um, and the drainage and drainage facilities and embankment that's gonna be used in preparation for the road. Um, if you recall our first contract was for long lead items of pre-construction services. So um, although my total, so my total cost for that uh, project and what's gonna be incorporated um, in package zero is the 5.33 million. However, I needed to subtract out uh, what I've already um, committed to for the long lead item. So I apologize for the, the error on that memo. Um, as this uh, comes through, um, I am going to be asking for your recommendation for approval to award a contract for 
$31.06. And on the funding table, that would reduce the portion of the intersection improvements from that 3.3 million shown on your memo to $1,575,000. $722.06. Um, I will say I also talked about what is referred to as package one in this area that you will likely see, I would suspect around the June timeframe, which will be for the rest of the road improvements that we're anticipating incorporating um, in for this project based on available funding that we have at the time. We're working with the contractor and the engineer record for that portion. Uh, questions on that particular memo? Contract? All right, I'm gonna move on. I know you guys have seen a lot of railroad things recently. We're getting a lot of positive movement. Um, our next one is for the South Downtown Railroad underpass reconstruction project, also referred to as the Nevada or the Tejo Nevada UPRR uh, design effort, which is an A-list project. Um, this is for to reimburse the Union Pacific Railroad for engineering review and efforts performed on uh, for our benefit by the railroad. Uh, the estimate provided by Union Pacific has been uh, $250,000. Uh, contract number three, uh, this is for a bridge maintenance project. Um, there is a map included um, in your packet. This is for um, some bridge maintenance uh, that's uh, um, for a bridge carrying the Hancock Expressway over a local drainage, which happens to be near the Silverhawk Avenue Bridge. Uh, during our recent bridge inspections, we uncovered some significant um, uh, concerns with cracking, um, effervescence, that, and just general maintenance issues for the bridge. So we're doing a significant bridge maintenance effort on this bridge. And this contract, uh, in doing so, this contract would be for uh, $986,411.40 to Wildcat Construction. Uh, the next contract is for roadway maintenance materials, uh, specifically to provide glass beads. It gets incorporated with our traffic uh, markings or striping systems. City went through an RFP process. We received two proposals. Uh, Swarok Reflex LLC was selected. Uh, this contract would be for a base year with the initial funding amount of $300,000, and the city would have the option of adding four option years in the future. Uh, the next one is for PPRTA on-call uh, landscaping for capital projects. Um, the city had gone through an RFP process and selected uh, uh, TP Enterprises. Uh, they are This would be their second option year or the third year of essentially a five-year potential contract uh, to provide uh, landscape maintenance services for capital projects, PPRTA capital projects. Um, that is in the amount of $370,594. Uh, the next contract is for slurry seal maintenance services. Um, Dave, I think you've asked me questions about other maintenance projects, and this has been one of our plans is to bring this program online. Um, and this is a project for a, a, a new uh, pavement uh, program, or we're re it's not necessarily new, we're reintroducing an old pavement program we've had we're able to fund slurry mix to provide um, some roadway maintenance activities. We've been budgeting $1.5 million. Uh, the city went through an RFP process. We did receive two uh, proposals. A1 chip seal was selected. Uh, this contract, that this is for the base year amount and the city has four option years. Uh, the next project is for 31st Street and the Pikes Peak crossing improvements. These are for pedestrian crossing improvements. The city has um, some grant funding, and then we're incorporating intersection safety improvement program funding in this for this project to include this pedestrian activated or push button activated pedestrian crossing signal um, at on 31st Street there by Pikes Peak Avenue. Um, we would, but city went through an RFP process, received three uh, or IFP process invitation for bid, received three bids. Uh, JARCO uh, was the lowest bidder, and we we're recommending an award the contract in the amount of $389,779.46. Todd, thanks for joining us online. I just had a quick question. 
in the event that it turns out that this PET signal is backing up traffic into Colorado and essentially into that intersection that now has the red light cameras with the city entertain maybe linking the timing of those two or, or doing something just to prevent the public from being stuck in that intersection? Uh, yeah, the, the, um, the intersections will be synced and essentially if there is a PED call, um, what will happen is the, um, the, uh, the light at Colorado and, um, uh, and um, 31st would be green for traffic on Colorado, so you wouldn't get trapped uh, in the intersection. Does so that make sense? If yeah, if it's green going westbound, though, you can turn right, correct? Right on the 31st Street? I think it's yes. that right. So you, yes, you can. essentially, yeah. if you had enough right turns, that could back up through, back up Colorado, correct? Yeah, okay. So, so you, if they're if they're going westbound on Colorado and they're turning right on 31st and that PED call is turning that red and you had enough cars in there, you could potentially back up on Colorado, correct? Yeah, but they would have, yes, if there is, yes, it could, but it, it, it's the PED signal. So it, it's the shortest, it's not a big delay. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't anticipate much of, much of an issue. Okay. And, and I've got my fingers crossed. If, if I see anything changing, I will definitely let you know. So thanks, Todd. Yep, sure. Yeah, reach out anytime. Thanks, Todd. Uh, any other questions on that? I'm going to move, keep moving on. All right. Uh, the city's next contract is for PPRT on call and ADA concrete services. Um, as you recall, we this is probably the third time we've talked about this. Uh, we city went through an RFP process. We selected six contractors. Uh, we previously funded uh, three of them. This will be the fourth one we're funding. Uh, this is going to be um, for HCD in the amount of one million one hundred eighty-two thousand eight hundred dollars and forty cents to provide the service for us for uh, in twenty twenty-three. Uh, the next contract um, is for one of two contracts for rustic hills. Uh, there's a map included with both this con for both uh, times I talk about rustic hills. This first one is for construction management services to be provided by Basis Partnership in the amount of four hundred ninety-three thousand seven hundred and fifty-five dollars. Um, the good news is the maintenance funds we've set aside for this. We have monies to uh, fund the construction for, and I should, uh, let me back up. Let me mention the next contract and hit that. Um, the second contract is for the construction of those roads um, uh, for in Rustic Hills. And again, the map is there. And I've also got listed the streets that are included. Um, when we've talked about this previously, when we went through the bid process, we weren't sure we were gonna have enough maintenance money saved up to be able to do the whole neighborhood at one time. Uh, the good news is we did have enough money to do it all at once as opposed to uh, future phases to cover both construction and the construction management. Um, and then the and the, you can see there's a very significant bid table with the construction contractor. Summers construction um, is for re being recommended for award, and uh, their bid amount was four million eight hundred and thirty two thousand five hundred and thirty two dollars. Questions on either of those? All right, and then the last one is for an engineering change order for HDR for the Circle Dry Bridge project. Um, this is to cover um, costs, some design changes in uh, response for stormwater requirements, additional railroad coordination and permit efforts, engineering services during construction, and then um, public engagement that's gonna be continuing during the construction pro process. Uh, the contract is in the amount of $741,788.14. Questions on that or any of the contracts that I presented today? I had just a, a, sh a short, quick question, I hope, on, on <clears throat> with the magnitude of this project and the impact on that end of town, the public engagement piece. Um, I know that there's a lot of traffic that goes south on 25, gets off and goes east on circle across those bridges over in to the fountain area and intersects back over in that area. Um, how 
how does the public engagement process work in getting the word out to the frequent travelers that mm -hmm. that frequent that that route? Yeah, so we have a multiple prong approach on how to get the word out um, from uh, from the city's website, and you can sign up for newsletters where you're getting weekly or biweekly construction updates or as things are happening on the site. Very similar to do in other projects, the city uses social media uh, sites. Uh, um, depending on the nature of the significant phase, we'll have press releases that go out that are broadcast on the news. And then you might see me do TV interviews that go along with those, which is one of my favorite things. Um, and then uh, uh, we'll also have message boards out there, advisory boards, you know, that folks can be advised to go through. So those are just, I think I'm, I feel like I'm missing some of those are some of the, the modes that we'll use to get that word out to the traveling public. And I, I actually, one other is we actually coordinate through our cone zone program through the ways right. as well. So there'll be travel advisory students from the construction. Great. Thank you. All right. Any uh, other questions for Gail on the city's projects? Anybody online? Not not seeing anyone. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to approve the city's request for projects? Uh, Dave Zolanoff, I'd like to uh, recommend that we uh, approve these projects. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I second. Second, Tony. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Gail. El Paso County projects, Josh. Good afternoon, Josh Palmer, El Paso County engineer. County has a single contract item to bring before you today. This is a new on-call contract. Our previous on-call contract expired in 22, 2022. So this is a new on-call contract, five-year contract. And you, as you can see in the attachments to the memo, there are dozens and dozens of various uh, consultants and vendors across multiple disciplines that we have awarded on-call contracts to. Um, this year, uh, a, a new approach that we're taking as opposed to what we've done in previous years is we have two separate on-call contract dollar amounts, uh, zero to 150,000 and then 150 to $500,000. So these contracts will be based, will be task-based. So there's no dollar amount uh, yet but the tasks are limited to those those two contract amounts. Um, it's not specific to PPRTA projects, but PPRTA projects will be able to draw and use these statements of qualifications for RTA contracts for professional services. Any questions? Just one question, Josh. With the number of contractors that you have there, is it possible that you will end up with a lot of them that have very small amounts within those ranges on the two different contracts? And uh, would that preclude them from, you know, participating in the contract? Not necessarily. So there's no limit on the dollar amount that a vendor could perform either on an annual or on the five over, over the course of the five-year contract. So these dollar amounts are, are, per project. So you could have consultant XYZ do have one contract for $150,000 next year, or they could have 10 contracts for 10 different projects or next year. So there's no limit to the dollar amount, only on the contract amount for per project. So for the, the year, you know, like for example, the, um, on the screen, it shows the first one being 150,000 to 500,000. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying that you could have 10 contractors that actually could go over that $500,000 figure? In aggregate, yeah. But they, but no single contract for no single project would exceed $500,000. At that point, if a project exceeds $500,000, it would then go through a, our typical RFP process. You just answered my next question. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. <clears> Thank <throat> you. 
<clears throat> yeah, you just answered mine. The assumption is if it's over 500,000, it goes to the RFP. So that was mine. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, we've got ourselves into some trouble in the past where we have a $100,000 on call contract that, that balloons to $5 million. And our procurement office does not like that. I hear you. <laughs> Brandy, did, Brandy, did you have something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say I love how you use the alphabet to really kind of break it all out. It was really easy to look at to figure out who had what. So congratulations, very organized. Thank you. I was trying to count how many and I had to I had to Google how many letters are actually in the alphabet because I forgot. So <laughs> yeah. Rick? I believe you're gonna have several CAC members who are, who are gonna have to recuse themselves on this vote because they work for the vendors that are on these lists. Yeah, I've got, uh, we, we have got 16 voting members today so we'll we'll see how many were left after the recusals okay um so the first process is let's just see who's recusal and who's left and then we'll if necessary we'll go through the bifurcation thing or crap that's just a lot of extra work so um <clears throat> i got a note from scott barnhart uh who else three so four total, that should be okay, right? Okay, so just for the record, Brandy, Dave, who else? Richard, okay. Um, so, and Scott, um, all right. Uh, so do I have a motion to approve the county? I move to approve since there's a Tony. I have a second. Larry Tobias, second. All those in favor, minus the people that recuse himself, uh, in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you. So for the minutes, that would be 12 to 0 to 4. All right. <clears throat> Good job. Item 7A, City of Colorado Springs Transit Services. Good day. Thank you. Um, Chair, members of CAC, Land Rail Transit Services Acting Manager. Uh, what's in your packet is our monthly report. Since this month, we are presenting the information from January this year. We figured, you know what, this is the, the very first report for 2023, and we'll try a new look. So instead of the normal eight pages in your packet, there are four pages. We try to shorten the report, condense the information, but still keep the, the, the key um, information in there. Um, so since this is the first month of this new look, I'll just go over the report probably in a little more detail, and then we can jump through um, in future months. The first page is basically the first section on the first page is an overview of the three modes of transportation that we, we provide transit services, the fixed route, Metro mobility and metro rides. Then the second section, we focused on the ridership information comparing January this year to January last year. And in January, 2023, we saw increased ridership uh, across board. Even if we had, it felt really bad in the last few months because of the driver shortage, because of the service cuts, we still provided more information in January this year compared to January last year. On the second page of the report, we will fill in more information as the year goes on. So it's basically a ridership comparison between fixed route in January last year compared to January this year, the Metro Mobility and Van Pool. Third page, the top portion of that pie chart, what we try to present is a, a big picture information. Out of the 169,438 trips we provided, how many, what is the percentage of those trips were provided by local fixed route, the big buses, and then what's the percentage provided by ADA and Vanpool? So from this part, pie chart, you'll see the majority, 96, 94% of the ridership were carried by the lo local fixed route, which is the backbone of our service. The table below, this is something that we did 
not have in the past. This will be the new information. So what we included in there is basically five year of information. For 2023, that would be the year to date information. Right now it's only January. But from 19 to 22, you will see the total number for that entire year of passenger trips, revenue service hours, which is basically how many hours the buses are running on the road, picking up passengers. That's um, Then the third column, trips, passenger trips per revenue service hours basically is efficiency uh, or passenger load, as they've mentioned before, um, information to capture how full that bus is. Um, as you can tell, the fixed route still carries the majority of the passengers in an hour compared to ADA paratransit around two, um, and VAMP is very different also. Then the last section of the report is transit highlights. Uh, we will keep including key information highlights of the months. Um, for your review for January, we included two projects in there. One is the service restoration. Since February 1st, when the, the new contractor took over, we have been restoring services. Um, right now, with the services that we cut, the only two frequency restoration are still pending is on Route 1 and Route 27. Currently, they're running on 30 minute frequency, and we should be running 15 minutes frequency. And the other service improvements are the ones that we proposed, we included in our budget um, in the last couple of years from PPRTA budget amendments that we were not able to add. We, we set aside the budget, but we didn't have drivers to, care, to, to provide those services. So we, with the new contractors since February 1st, we have been adding those services. So combined restoring what we cut during COVID and adding what we had budgeted in the budget. And we are looking at 94% of those revenue service hours being provided in January. So um, right now we are looking at, we were five drivers short from what we need to provide those full service. Yes. If you recall those numbers, we were 35, 19, um, 13, and now it's five. So the trend is very encouraging. Good. Good. Then the second highlight we have in the, in the report is the mobile ticketing. We implemented mobile ticketing in May and we what's in this report is information from June through December. Um, we were actually surprised and, um, to see that 29% of the purchases of bus passes incurred using mobile ticketing. So that is a very um, good number in the very first six months of the project implementation. So we did not include the frequency report that the CAC actually requested because we feel like last month we, we did good comparison. Our, our question was basically answered. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Lynn? Dave? A great report, as always. I, I couldn't be a bigger fan of you, the great work you're all doing, and, and the fine work uh, that, that the system is moving forward with. Uh, I seem to bring up maybe all too often what's going on in Denver as a barometer of things that should not be going on here. So, so I will keep with that trend and just ask a general question. Uh, there's a lot of press going on about, about law enforcement issues with the Denver RTD system. Uh, both unwelcome riders uh, staying in the buses for the warmth, and uh, now more recently, uh, park and rides with a terrible vandalism problem due to surveillance cameras that are out, non-functional, and apparently a very high rate of, uh, of vehicle intrusion at the park and rides with people waiting to catch an RTD bus. Can you just talk briefly about, uh, are there any, hopefully not many parallels uh, with, with the terrible things going on in the Denver RTD and uh, what's obviously apparently not happening here in a good way? Denver RTD is not alone in those facing those challenges. Uh, our policy also says riders have to get off the bus at the end of the line. Okay. Uh, we have 
it, it's up and downs. Recently, we haven't had too many issues with that. Drivers are doing a good job enforcing that policy. Um, but we do see that throughout our system as well. Um, other issues Denver RTD is facing, yes, we have those issues as well. Um, we work very closely with um, our security guard um, and with drivers dispatch. Um, if there are incidents along the um, on the bus, the, they are reported and uh, dispatchers have the ability to call 911 if anything okay. happens. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then one second unrelated question to that operational question, if I may. Uh, again, uh, I, I was in a meeting recently with CDOT, and they're talking a lot more, and I've mentioned this before, about mobility centers, uh, these regional mobility centers. I'm surprised in the most recent meeting, CDOT is trumpeting that they will have four of the 12 completed by the end of the year. Uh, again, these are uh, these are locations where, and there's a variety of ways to do them, but basically you pull the interstate apart and in the median, you drop in this bus only station where pedestrians walk across half of the interstate. They board the bus in the middle. That way, the bus, for example, the Woodman Road park and ride is a good example. You don't have to get off at Woodman Road, make a, make a double left turn, get in there, pick people up, then make a double left turn, get back out. So the bus loses 10 minutes or so just in stopping to pick up two people at the Woodman park and ride. When you do these mobility centers and CDOT, like I said, I think they said they had 12 planned, four completed by the end of this year. Uh, they all look like they're going into northern Colorado. Uh, uh, what a surprise that is. Yeah. Uh, but I was wondering, can, can you address uh, the, the, the concept in general, maybe even offer an overview in the future of the impact? I think that, that, that and, and again, in a good way, this would be, this is an incredible pivot point. This really is a game changer for transit in the four Northern Colorado centers where they can have, uh, I think a huge ridership increase as a result of this new concept, but I don't see any of it coming this way. I think Gail mentioned that we are working on the Academy uh, Enhanced Transit uh, project. We, yeah. it's still in the very early phase of the scope development. Um, we will, that, in addition to the Q jumper that you mentioned last month, um, those are the things that we will be considering. Um, basically, you need strong ridership and good locations with all the connection and accessibility to make it happen. But yes, we um, we are looking into those options when we develop further yes just, transit options. Just like to encourage you, maybe at some point to uh, to keep us posted on on the since that's the, I'm not saying it's the flavor of the month, but it really is mm -hmm. a game changer for transit across the state. Yep. And as I said, for all of them now to be going in north of here is a bit puzzling. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Can you say anything about Can you say anything about Brian? Brian, which one is yeah position? Oh yes. Um. Our transit planning supervisor position has been vacant since um, mid-January. We are in the hiring process. We concluded the interviews uh, recently and in the HR process of making the offer to the top candidates. So hopefully our new planner will be here um, soon. Yeah, Brian moved to Oregon. So uh, yeah. Washington State or Oregon? Oregon. Or Oregon, yes. Yeah. So... Best of luck to Brian. He's been very consistent here over the years. And and uh, so best of luck to Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Randy? Scott Barnhart has a question, and then I'll go after oh, him. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Scott. I hadn't looked at the screen. Go ahead. Well, I just want to compliment Transit on the new format. I think it makes it much easier and quicker to get the same information out of. So um, kudos. Thank you. Angie, you had your hand up? Ditto. No, I think Scott had his hand up and Angie took her spot. Oh, okay. So, all right. So, I actually did have a question, but I wanted Scott to go first. I'm assuming this is going to be monthly. Yes. Like, so, your year over year boardings, I can understand it having a purpose once we get to the end of the year. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's going to look exactly the same, and the bottom line is just going to change every month. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing it annually, can you do it monthly? because right now we don't really have anything to compare. We just get to look into the past sure. every month and then the new numbers aren't gonna mean anything. Maybe monthly, 
between 13 and well, 20, 2023 and 2022, or are you thinking for, mostly for all five years? For, well, for 2019, if you put in the okay. number from January, then okay. we can compare it between 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And yes. then when you get to February, you can have January and February. And then when you get to March, you can have January, February, and March. Yep. Because as it is, it, it's year to date. We won't be able to compare it. Yeah. Year to date for all of them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Make we'll sense? Do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments for Land? Thank you very much, ma'am. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Item 7B, board policy number 30 revision. Mr. Chair, I'll start off and uh, Gail will fin help finishing up. As the GAC will remember, uh, last month, the uh, city asked for four contracts and four projects to be added to board policy 12, which allows for a higher threshold for change orders for larger projects. Um, when it got to the board, the board approved it as recommended by the CAC, but the board asked for um, staff to research whether or not we could have a sliding scale that future larger projects could just be slotted into and be be approved more easily than than adding them to board policy 12. So Gail and I talked and um, she prepared a draft sliding scale, which is uh, in your packet. And uh, she and I talked and it it made more sense to put it in board policy 30 than board policy 12. Um, so that's that's where we're recommending putting it. Um, and then eventually board policy 12 will become extinct when those projects and those contracts expire. Gail, your turn. Uh, thank you. And I, I do want to uh, mention that uh, the county also was in party with this. Was it just done in a vacuum? Um, we have not had the opportunity to share it with some of the other member governments, but we did work since we have the larger contracts, we did spend a lot of time working on this together. So I want to make sure um, that you knew that up front. So um, since the board asked us to look at it, what would make sense for um, a sliding scale when it came to change order values, we really looked at the a range of contract values and what made sense from a percentage of that contract or relative percentage of the, that contract range, it made sense. And in the end, after doing a couple of bits of analysis, I really felt like it was important to stick with around 2% of your contract value um, in these tiers. So for tier one, it's the 1.25 million to 5 million. Um, that change order threshold is 100,000. And if you think about it at 2%, um, that's the 2% on the $5 million. So that really gets you consistent with what, how we were applying this policy 12 in the past, because that change order level in policy 12 had been that 100,000. And then the aggregate had been either five or 10%. In this case, we're just recommending a total aggregate of 10%. Um, going and looking on that next tier, we thought it made sense from a band to look between $5 million and $10 million. Um, if you look at 2% of the $10 million, again, that's the 200,000. Um, so we thought that made sense. And then when you start looking at um, contracts more than 10 million, um, we originally, we had actually even looked at a, another a three a tier three and tier four level, but really what made sense, are you just gonna keep going 10 increments and you sort of look at 2%, that number got pretty high when you looked at those top ends. So we really thought it didn't make sense to do that, that if we really looked at contracts more than $10 million, uh, 2%, of $20 million would be 400,000. So that's how that was set. And um, we did, we thought we might have a sliding scale on the aggregate contract value or the aggregate change order total in comparison to the original contract value. But in the end, we felt that it was important to say with 10% all the way across. Um, I would say, so there's some cleanup language. And so in addition to the table, this would be replaced that information section on the back of that memo. Um, with this sliding scale. And I would say one, one thing that I wanna make sure it's clear in the last sentence on the first page that active projects currently included in policy 12 are now gonna be permitted or would now be permitted to use this, um, this scale versus policy 12. So essentially if the board were to accept this um, change to policy 30, policy 12 essentially goes away. 
in, in total. So I just want to make sure that's the one clarification. Um, so with yeah. that, I don't know if Josh, anything you wanted to add? Any questions? The only, the only thing I would, um, it's not clear that the 100, 200, 400 is 2% of the contract. Yeah, that's intentional. I'm just telling you how we came up with the numbers. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, we thought about doing it at a percentage base, and it really made sense to have round numbers, so we're not looking at things okay. differently all the time. So, but how we set these tiers and those upper limits on those dollars were kind of based on those bands of ranges okay. on the upper end of the range, with the exception of tier three, because when we were looking at this, we started with a tier three and tier four. We really kind of picked that uh, as that twenty million dollar contract and just set that 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 would be the level of anything that would be over ten million dollars. Okay acceptable do i have a motion um any or any discussion on any further discussion on it um do i have a motion to approve it i was you turn your mic on i have a question okay yeah, i had a comment too so all right <laughs> sorry so so back to policy 12 you mentioned that the projects in policy 12 could also use this to apply to it is there a need to keep policy 12 or could we just move all the projects into policy 12, essentially nowhere, and just say that this is now the policy, and that way member governments don't have to look at both of these every time we have an issue? Uh, that is what we are recommending, if that's what the board chooses. Um, and I don't know how, if you would just retire that, Rick, or reuse that policy number. Um, I know. You basically suspend 12. Right. And and this policy would become the active policy, right. but we want to retain it for historical records keeping purposes because it records all the projects where we've made exception to policies. Is that right? I think I think we just leave it in the policy binder, um, but just not use it. Maybe suspends. Suspended order. Can I can I add if you think about it with what's on policy 12, it's really the same as tier one um, values. Um, if it's an active project, and I'm going to pick on a cat the academy projects, you know, that I've got one that's over $20 million that we just put in policy 12, even though it's going to still be there for historic reasons, change orders in the future could use the tier three values in the table. So, so Gail, since you brought that one up, walk us through on, on a larger project. The, the concern I have, and, and I'm all for simplifying, and I'm all for um, uh, moving forward with some some streamlining of this uh, for all the right reasons. Uh, I do get a bit uncomfortable as the numbers get bigger and bigger. A half million dollar, well, four hundred thousand uh, dollar. I would never want to say blank check in public or have the public say. There's there's now a blank check for four hundred thousand dollars, though some could make the argument. Walk me through in a ten million dollar project today. What's the uh, approval limit? And as I read this now, on a ten million dollar project in the future, it'd be four hundred thousand dollars, right? Well, just you know, compare before and after on a ten million dollar project. So, on a, if it was a ten million dollar project that was included in policy twelve, it would be a hundred thousand dollars or ten percent. Uh, of the aggregate total, or it's a hundred thousand dollars, or the total of all the change orders in a comparison of the the original contract amount percentages, or that aggregate total, ten percent. So, so in a simplest form, then simple form, ten million dollars today, hundred thousand dollar change order authority. Right, and then with this change, it would be two hundred thousand dollars. Or would it be four hundred thousand? Well, no. more, than 10, more than 10. Right, more than 10. You said 10 million. Oh, okay, okay. So, 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 so 10 million <laughs> and 0. 0.000 and 1. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. So it'd be then $400,000 up from $100,000. No, at $10 million, it would be 200000 but if you had one at ten million dollars a month. Oh, ten million dollars a month. I'm sorry, I missed the one cent. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, it would be four hundred thousand dollars up from a uh, hundred thousand today. Correct. So we're quadrupling the change order authority in, in, in that most extreme example. Right. That, and that is the most extreme example, but yes. And if you think about it, that would be changing. 
the ability of the jurisdiction to process that change order in four percent of the original contract value. So you'd be using forty percent of that aggregate capacity before you'd have to come so, back for approval all the time to this board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know that I can support that. Uh, I'm happy to enter some other discussion though. It's just it's just give a four hundred thousand dollar. I don't have a better word for it. It's not a blank check, but a four thousand uh, dollar item that does not go before this board does give me some concern. Not oversight. I'm sorry. Not oversight. Well, not oversight. It is on the change order. It is on the change order report that is informational, so it's included report. in our packet every month, um, which is subject to questions at any point. So it is provided through us to the board. It's just not discussed as an as a single line item. Yeah, and that's absolutely correct. And I actually meant to to bring that up. So I'm glad that that came up as an item. Tony, you had a comment. Yeah. Um. On the aggregate side, the ten percent aggregate. Does that mean on the ten million and one? If you had um you know, three $300,000 ones and then come up with 101,000, you'd have to come here for that 101,000? Yes. And okay. any and any change orders after that. Okay. Say that again. So the aggregate, if they had done administratively three three $300,000 uh, change orders, now they have a fourth one they want to do. It's no longer administrative. It has to come here first because now it's going to be over 10% of the 10 million. It's the aggregate of all change orders. Yeah. So now they're breaking a million. That's 10%. The aggregate now is over. So every single change order after that has to come back here. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Great. To address Dave's concern, uh, Dave, is there a top figure? Um, because th there, this was larger. When, and I questioned it. So this is down from uh, a first draft. So is there an absolute figure 300,252? Is there an absolute max that's comfortable? You know, I, I, I don't know why I say that. It's just a subjective empirical feeling. 250 ish, 200 somewhere in there. Maybe you just lump the tier two and three together. I'm certainly comfortable increasing the the, the size of that. The four hundred thousand dollars, or to your example, a million dollars, that does not go before this board causes me concern. I would vote to oppose that. I'm sorry, this is the first time this year, probably that, that I've done that. Well, it's in February, first time in a while that I've opposed something uh, <laughs> openly, but but I'll be opposing this. Well, we we have the four projects that were approved uh, by the CAC and the board last month, so they're under policy twelve, so they have the historic increase in uh, the change order limit. So this is not time sensitive in my opinion, unless either Gail or Josh feel that it is. So if the, the CAC wants to uh, uh, think about it, postpone it, um, come back with a, an alternative, I, I, it's, it's up to the chair to, yes, chair. to propose. Tony. Uh, maybe something that would be a little more um, accessible there. Would it be okay? I mean, ap other than the hundred thousand, for the larger tiers to go to the two percent of the smaller number instead of the top number. Right. So you've got two percent of ten million would be two hundred thousand. Two two percent of ten million and one would be two hundred thousand. Uh, and I, I mean, I guess two percent of five million is already a hundred thousand. So you can maybe do a couple smaller tiers and keep it at the two percent being the maximum as opposed to the minimum. In that, in that tier, I can support that. And while you're thinking, um, the part of it that says is the board requested. So you may have already stated this, but could you repeat what it is the board yeah. was looking for, just so we have a little bit more background? Because this wasn't yours. This wasn't ours. This is the board saying, "Please bring this forward." So if you yeah. could correct it, I think Rick wants to. Yeah, it was the board request, and Jim, you were there. Um, Larry, I think you were there too. Um, the board chair just said, please research a sliding scale uh, to see if um, projects could be slotted into the sliding scale um, w without necessarily revising policy 12 every time you add a 
a contract or a project. So just a, a sliding scale. So uh, no no parameters were given. So that this is this is a draft for your discussion. And it was it was not a directive. It was just say take a look at it and discuss it. He'd like the CAC to take a look at it and discuss it. So. Um, can I make an assumption that that was to minimize the amount of change orders or just to not have to put things in policy 12? Did, did you get to not have to put things? Well? Okay. So I was to not have to put things in policy 12 so that we weren't necessarily moving projects to have the scale in place so that we don't have to do that. So that makes sense. And given that, Dave, does that help you with any kind of a number feeling then? Uh, it does. I'm still uncomfortable with this number. Uh, again, I can't explain why, uh, but I'd be more comfortable with the smaller number, I think. All right, Rick, and then me. Yeah. I got a question. Yeah, I, I, I see a streamlining is really very important, but I can overdo it too. When you get over to 10 million, you're talking about a half a billion dollars. And I, I, I like one and two, but I think tier three, it has to be a stopping point. I mean, <laughs> We can over streamline. Uh, my concern is that, kind of like we were talking about putting funds into a project for, uh, program. Well, the same thing applies here. The bigger numbers we get, the harder it's going to be to justify to the public. Mr. Chair, um, in conferring with my colleague from the county, and we've not had a chance to run this by uh, Mr. Sonnenberg. Um, would it make sense to propose changing um, the 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 percentage from the change order down to 1.5 in that tier three level, and is still using that at that 10 million dollar level? So it would set that at 300 thousand dollars, and leave that as an upper limit for that tier three. And it would make sense that if a larger contract, your change order percentage should go down anyway. So I, didn't, I think that makes sense, and we would be comfortable recommending that as an amendment to this memo that's acceptable to the CAC. I can support that. Just, just for the sake of clarity, could you walk that by us all one more time so we all understood? Yes, absolutely. So in the bottom line, let me talk about first what this memo would change. Uh, tier three would still say it's tier three and it would still have be over $10 million. But instead of the change order value being 400,000, we would recommend it being 300,000 and the aggregate still staying at 10%. That 300,000 comes from looking at applying a change order rate of 1.5% on a $10 million contract. That's 3% on No, it's 1.5%. 300,000. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I meant, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Right. I got too many. It is. I apologize. It's 20 million. It is 20 million. And, and I apologize. Yes. So, because what we were looking at when, we, again, we had tiers three and four, tier three, when we first were looking at, we were looking at that range from 10 to $20 million which is really kind of a sweet spot contract value for a lot of these capital projects. Um, but then it, um, when you get over tier four, you know, that the dollars just really got out of the realm of being reasonable. Um, so we would recommend that 1.5% on 20 million or $300,000 for tier three. Thank you. It's really sitting right in front of me. <laughs> One more time. So, so, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So for tier three, it would change to three hundred. Keep ten percent or not? The ten percent aggregate would be would remain. Okay. The, or an aggregate of ten percent. Yeah. yeah. So, so in, in the thought process, yeah. Yeah. So our benchmark, our thought process was for each tier. Let's look at the top threshold of that tier range. So for tier one, is five million dollars. Go with 2% for a change order, $100,000 is 2% of five. Same with tier two, the top end of that, that range was 10 million, 2% of that would be 200,000. And when you go to tier three, since there's no top end, it's just 10 plus, we landed on $20 million as that kind of de fact, default top end. So that's how we originally arrived at 400,000. We would bump that 2% down to 1.5% and change the change order value to 300,000. So. Then do you change tier two to 150,000 since that's 1.5%? No, they would only change the percentage change for the, the last tier. tier. Just for the last tier, because that was that seems to be the, the 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 area of concern. Much improved. I think we're where where I still wouldn't want to see a, a newspaper headline is million dollar change order. 
or a million dollars in changes. Maybe, maybe is there a way to cap it? At, and, and again, I think it's just that when you get over a million dollars, then that starts to. Uh, well, the ten percent is the cap. At that point, everything comes before it. So we okay. we can't have an individual change order approved administratively that exceeds three hundred thousand dollars. Right. Or we could have three hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, but the next three hundred thousand will exceed the ten percent. So that one and every other change order, no matter how small, has to be approved. Completely agree on a ten million yeah. and one dollar yeah. contract. Yeah. If you had a thirty million dollar project, now you're three million. Correct. Okay. That get that gives me the willies. So having multiple capital sub million, three hundred thousand dollar contract not to exceed a million dollars. Yeah. Why can't we just stop it at okay. two? Can it, Tier well, two. May I make one more? Let, let's go back to the original intent of policy twelve and to address Brandy's comment. To my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the original intent of policy twelve. <clears throat> was twofold. One, to keep the staff on large projects, to keep the staff from having to run up here every time there's a $100,000 change order on a $20 million project, because some of those projects, when scope channel, whatever the case is, could drive a larger thing. And so the purpose of 12 was to come back into the process, define, defend, and record the need for that additional threshold, if you will, because it's a larger project. And it also serves the purpose of those headlines to be able to say we've recorded and it's been approved, it's been discussed, defended, justified, and we've gone ahead and approved it for those purposes. So we would not want to do away with the process, we just want to, I think the intent here, what the when the board made the comment, I didn't quite understand it, but when we've got the discussion going, I'm beginning to understand it, <clears throat> was having, rather having a set amount of over 200,000, I think it was, right, for 100,000, instead of just having that set amount, uh, on those larger 10, $20 million projects that could require coming back multiple times is for the larger projects have a larger threshold than the smaller projects. And, but you still have the process to go through to document why and what. Uh, and and that, that's the big thing to me is the accountability piece of someone writing an article in the end and they see this project increase by $300 million or $30 million, whatever. And we've done that Colorado Avenue and there's been several that we've got the documentation to show why we did what we did and then we can justify that to the public. And so that, I think that policy 12 is part of that accountability process in, in my opinion, but so. I, I agree wholeheartedly. The the I think the 10% aggregate on the top makes perfect sense because I mean if we just look at the past year, even on consumer stuff, we we've got an eight percent inflation rate, right? So and I know construction's even higher than that. So if you have to if you put an aggregate of a particular number, they're gonna hit it like that on big projects. If you do it as a percentage, then you are matching the economy at least to some extent. So, um, and with a large project, you're going to hit a, a a specific dollar cap way too way too quickly. I think so. The aggregate, I, I would keep it at a percentage. And if you don't like ten percent, maybe a different percentage. But I think that's a good percentage personally. And, and it's with some help from some of you, I'm willing to rather than keep bantering this around, um, I'm willing to take not necessarily a recommendation, but a summary of discussion to the board next week and get some feedback on whether they think that's bad, you're good, and then we would come back and then make a formal recommendation. Um, uh, we, could, we could do something like that if, if we, you know, not knowing how they might feel about some of that, 
Um, and it was one individual. So we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes, but I'll, I'll do whatever you guys want to do. Rich. Yeah. And I was just going to make a suggestion, you know, I think Dave, your concern is on those, you know, mega projects greater than 10 million. If we get like a $40 million project at some point, they're going to have, you know, up to $4 million. So could we put it as a percentage or a cap dollar amount? So you focus on the, the $20 million or 2 million, whichever is lesser. And that way it, it at least provides some balance there and you don't go all the way up. You know, if we get a $50 million project, then it can automatically matter go up to 5 million. And so that's just another another thought. You could put a percentage and an absolute. Yeah, cap. yeah I could support that too. Larry? Uh, Jim, I, I think your idea of not proposing or recommending this item 30 today, but taking it to the board next week and giving them an overview of the comments that you know have come from everyone here. Um, and get their input, then we can go ahead and, you know, finalize the wording uh, for an actual recommendation possible next month after the CAC. I think that'd be good to let the uh, board hear, you know, what we have discussed and, uh, you know, get their input from it. Okay. Ann, did you have a comment? Well, I would, I just agree with Larry. I think I think it needs more thought. And the, if you could explain to the directors what we've talked about and they can toss it around. And Rick said it isn't essential we decided today. So I think I think you're wise. Okay, Rick. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna attempt to summarize the issues that Jim would bounce off the board. <clears throat> Number one would be, is there an absolute cap per change order it is 500,000, 400,000, 300,000, 250, 200. Is there an absolute cap that the board wants to set? And, and then the sliding scale could back into that. And then to Rich's comment, is, is there an absolute cap on the aggregate dollar amount on these much larger projects, like like he just said. So, <clears throat> so uh, Rich, what was yours? A forty million dollar contract. So ten percent could be four million before the the aggregate of the change orders comes before the CAC on the board. So board is on a forty million dollar project is four million. That that's staff driven. And only info to the CAC and board. Board, are you okay with four million staff driven info only to the CAC and board on a 40 million project? So to me, those are the two. Are the, is there a third or a fourth issue for Jim to bounce off the board? Mr. Chairman, I mentioned Craig, you had a comment. Just a minute, Gail. Yeah, I have a question kind of about the mechanics. Uh the 10%. Uh, aggregate is that based on the initial contract value or does that continue to go up as change orders it, get it's added? based on a zero contract value and it states that in the paragraph below I okay I know it's in one of these paragraphs around there as well all right thank um, you can I mention that the 10 why we really started with that 10 percent aggregate because that's what the policy 12 puts in place today so going to the example that um, Mr. Samora had that $40 million contract, it is $4 million today, just the bites at the pie are in $100,000 chunks versus $300,000 chunks. Okay, so you want, what do you want me to do? You want me to take it or you want to mull on it and we, we put something together next month? I mean, I, I'd suggest, I think Rick summarized it pretty well. I mean, for the board is, is there an absolute cap that they're comfortable with on each individual change order? Is there an absolute cap that they would be comfortable with on an aggregate? Yeah. You okay with that, Dave? I sure am. I think yeah, I take it forward as a concept. I think uh, uh, explain that uh, that uh, just what happened here. Obviously, that uh, that the board didn't feel as comfortable with the initial proposal that came forward. It sounds like Rick, you had some concerns earlier on as well. So you could weave in. The comments were this is this is a step in that direction 
but it's probably not as far as uh, some might have liked to have gone for the obvious reasons. Yeah, and, and in, for those that know me for a while, I, I'm always very sensitive to staff time. And so uh, there's a lot of work that goes into managing a $50 million project. And if you've got to stop every time you got a $10,000 change order and run it up through the process, it's impractical in a lot of cases because you've got to continue work, but it could be next week and you got to wait three weeks to get approval. So uh, it, it just makes common sense to me to have some kind of range or scale that is workable, but yet still accountable. And that's where we find that balance, in my opinion, of trying to, to balance that. So it seems like we have consensus. Yeah. So you know, take it, vote. I'll take it forward as a discussion see how what their feedback is and we'll come back and then make a formal recommendation next month everybody all right with that everybody online okay with that okay all right very good good discussion thank you uh city car rings monthly change order acquisition report uh we were just talking about um this is uh, information only. Any questions uh, on the city's change orders? All right, seeing none. Uh, Green Mountain Falls also has some this time. Uh, any questions or changes on their Stilling Basin uh, change orders? All right. Um, <clears throat> quarter reports and program status reports. Mr. Rick. These are the quarterly reports from the six member governments uh, pursuant to the comprehensive IGAs between the Pikes Peak RTA and each member government. Um, be glad to take questions or refer uh, any questions or comments to the respective uh, government staffs. Information only. I point out to the uh, the, the newer members. Um, this, along with the annual report, is something um, that you can put aside from your CAC meeting and use as a reference point when you get questions on things. A lot of work, as many of you know, a lot of work goes into something like this. Um, on, and, But at the same time, I've referred to this thing over time. When you get some kind of comments from somebody bad-mouthing a project on next door or something, you can very quickly go to these things and give them the facts um, and it's worked out really well. So um, just hang on to it and use it as appropriate. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Richard. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to refer to the Elso County, Elso Paso County um, right up on uh, Highway 105 and ask some questions. Okay. Uh, Josh, <clears throat> uh, you are still there? Still here. Okay. I, uh, I think most of my comments probably <clears throat> uh, are not concerned with your, they certainly are not your, uh, responsibility that you now hold, and I'm not sure how long you have been with El Paso County. So I and I don't know at what levels. So I uh, I think my remarks are directed at a higher level within the department, starting with the county engineer before you, uh, and uh, but. Uh, let me start with it. Uh, looking at the project description, I see that you have project A and B, and these are defined as a high priority projects, right? About as high priority as they get, yes. And project C to E is not. What are you talking about? Uh, I guess, relatively speaking, that's correct. So um, what happened was when, you know, 
through my research, when we proposed this as a project for PPRTA2 10 plus years ago, basically all we listed was roadway improvements from I-25 to Highway 83. And like uh, many other projects, especially in, in RTA2, was the scope and the expectations for what would be required were very broad. So we decided that the priorities would work uh, west to east because that's where the development where the traffic uh where people live where we believe the progress is going to uh, uh, improvements would be necessary so we broke it off into phases bite-sized pieces into phases that we could then address as uh scopes were refined defined and refined and as budgets were solidified uh so we got phase a phase b and then everything else which is c through e all the way out to 83 so while it's not a priority respective to phases A and B, it is a it's a section of the project that's going to require some level of improvement because that's what was presented to and voted on uh, by or approved by the voters. So it's not a priority at the moment because we haven't defined exactly what's going to be required. Uh, I th our approach is let us get going with construction for phase A and phase B and determine what we're gonna have left over in project A list funding for the region. And our, our approach is not to, to hoard all the money that's left over and pour that all into this giant stretch of roadway. Uh, it's to identify what is an appropriate scope based on funds that are left over and be a regional partner in, in allocating money that's left over so not only we can we can meet the commitments of improvements all the way out to highway 83 but also free up money for other projects which are are a priority to the region as well i i believe in, in effect what you're saying is uh projects a and b are in category a of the recently approved uh that's category uh the first category and the work on project c to e are what i would call in the b category is that right yeah i think so yeah if i'm interpreting what you're getting at yeah it's it's a priority but relative to phases a and b it's not as high of a priority at the moment because we need to get through the more important phases, which are A and B. I I I, I understand that, <clears throat> and uh, that also means, unfortunately, because of the rules that were adopted, which were the same as before, everyone else has to complete uh, their priority A's before anybody gets priority B. But anyway. Uh, where I don't see uh, what is the definition of the end of Project C? What uh, what intersection? That is part of the the component where the scope and limits of those additional phases is not clearly defined yet. We don't okay. know. We know that. <laughs> yeah, um, you're going to have two projects. Uh, I guess in there, <clears throat> okay, but they're not defined yet. Correct. All right. Turning to uh, turning to page seventy nine <clears throat> uh, under project status, information on the corridor plan slash conceptual design is available at www.105corridor.com. I uh, Pull that up, and I notice that uh, in the statement <clears throat> on the Harway, Highway 105 Carter Project News, under the fourth paragraph, it is the second, well, I'll skip the second signature. You know. um, the second, well, maybe I won't. The second segment of the project, known as Project B, Lake Woodmore Drive to Martindale Drive, will, 
generally include widening the road to three lanes. And I am assuming now that that may continue on all the way to 83. Am I incorrect in stating that it was my belief that Highway 105, which used to be uh, managed by the state, but was turned over to the county in exchange for uh, uh, powers being uh, becoming the responsibility all the way, pretty much all the way as a state responsibility, but that <clears throat> Highway 105 was originally designed to be a four-lane highway. Am I correct or incorrect? Um, I don't know if it's possible to be correct and incorrect at the same time. Um, I would say, yeah, yes, you're correct. It, that is the overall intention of Highway 105 is to be four lanes. Um, the long-term build out, but as you know, we don't always build out to the long-term classification of a road until it's necessary. Sometimes we don't know what the need is going to be for highway 105 out east into the black forest area. So as we progress and as there is a need, that's why we haven't clearly defined the segments C through E is because we don't quite know there's still additional information that we're collecting to determine what is going to be required and what we can afford to do. So while four lanes is going to be the ultimate configuration, most likely of Highway 105 between I-25 and Highway 83, it doesn't necessarily mean that's what we're going to do in the next couple of years. If that I, makes sense. I I just uh, I just am disturbed, <clears throat> and I discuss this. Uh, I discussed I discussed this for with the yesterday with the executive director as to wasn't it his understanding that it was a, to be a four lane segment and uh, was that correct and Rick was not a hundred percent sure but he said that he believed it was indeed. Uh, designated as a four lane initially, and I find that going down to a three lane uh, reflects some attitudes within the Department of Public Works that because of the great delay and the high costs that have resulted in this great delay and frankly I think incompetence uh, not of you but of previous people within the or other people in the Department of Public Works it uh, because of cost it now is more or less being looked at as a three lane, and that's why it's in that segment I just read. And I am furious about that. And uh, I hope you will pass that on to the uh, acting director of public works. And before, before the year is out, before I leave, uh, I will probably personally carry that to the members of the Board of County Commissioners. Thank you. Okay. Um, Josh, I, um, a, a question came up, came to mind during some of that discussion, um, not about three lane versus four lane, but um, within project A, B, and then C through E, and 105 is an A-list project. What portion of that 
how do you determine how your 105 project is quote fully funded? Does that include some work in C through E based on available funding in 24 budget, 23, 24 budget? Um, or does that end with project B and C E would be C through E would be your B list project? Uh I think we kind of went through this process and we were working to define fully funded and we use this kind of as an example um, and we we conferred with the uh, RTA's legal counsel we have to do something on segments C through E okay now, we have to do something what that something is it it's not yet defined so our plan was once we get a uh, a contractor on board for segment b then we can look at it we know how much a is going to cost we have we know how much b is going to cost how much money is left over for a list projects for the region and then use that as kind of a um a starting point to determine what is appropriate to fulfill the commitments to do something on c through e so it, it all depends on how much money a and b cost and relative to how much money is left over and what we feel is an appropriate um uh, an appropriate approach to the remaining segment to follow through on that commitment. Okay, that makes sense. All right, uh, Rick. I agree with everything that uh, Josh has said because I asked Jennifer Ivey, the, the board attorney, to render a, a legal opinion on what he just said that the the A list pro VPRTA two A list project is Highway one hundred five I twenty five to Highway eighty three, and so I asked her if the county just did uh, a mile of that instead of five miles, is that completely funded? And she said, no, that, that something has to be done on the entire length. Whether it's widening the shoulders or, or putting yeah, up. Or bike lanes yeah. or turn lanes or Axel diesel lanes, something on the entire length to be declared completely funded. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> you know, uh, some people might want the whole whole stretch four lane with with uh, turn lanes, uh -huh. et cetera. But um, and, and Mr. Chair, you, you talked about the the C three E being a B list. It, it can't be a B list. It. Okay, it's the Highway one hundred five is not on the PPRT two B list. Okay, the, the entirety is A list. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Larry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and this follows up with what just Rick uh, said about Highway one hundred five. Uh, in some ways, this discussion that we've been having concerning 105 also applies to um, Eastonville Road, because Eastonville was identified as an A-list project in uh, PPRTA2, going all the way from um, McLaughlin all the way out to Latigo Boulevard. Yes. But right now, they're identifying only being able to accomplish, they've broken up Eastonville in the same way they've broken up 105, is that Eastonville is now broken up into two segments too, uh, because of the cost um, of what has happened over the years. Now, I don't completely agree with Richard on what he said, um, as far as, um, you know, the staff trying to work some of these projects, especially like 105 and Eastonville, it's been difficult because of the, they were so long ago identified and approved in PDRTA2 that the cost estimates were, and, and this was one reason why they did some cost estimating for projects on PPRTA3, because the cost estimating on PPRTA2. Pardon? Skeletal. Yeah, skeletal. that's a good word. <laughs> I, I had another word, but I think your word is much better, uh, Rick. So, um, you know, what we're dealing with, like I say, not only on 105, but all, also on Eastonville is fully funded projects, but they're having to be put in and broken up. And yes, they're going to be going along and they may not be what was originally planned, but they do have to be fully funded from the start of the project all the way to the end of the project. 
in some form or another. And on those two projects in, in the voter approved ballot, uh, Highway 105, it doesn't say improvements. It doesn't say four laning. It doesn't say center turn lane or XL diesel lanes. It just says Highway 105 colon I-25 to, to Highway 83. On Eastonville, it's uh, Eastonville Road, McLaughlin to Latigo, period. It do doesn't say what, it just says the start and the finish point. But least. it is, both of those are projects that need to be funded uh, before they can go to the B list. Like you say, whether it's putting in bike lanes, uh, you know, turn lanes, uh, you know, there's a lot of places uh, along 105 that uh, it would be nice to have left-hand turn lights. Um, you know, that would be the type of improvements to make that road a Safer. much better road than what it is right now, which then could get to a point where it's fully funded. But until they do the design, like for example, on um, project C to E, on 105 and also on phase two of Eastonville, uh, you really don't know exactly, you know, what you're talking about as far as the design and also the costs that you have to deal with. Well, and I'll just add to that. One of the things we want to make sure we do is we don't want to just go out there and do work so we can check a box that says we did something. Exactly. We want to make exactly. sure that whatever we decide to do is something that's not throwaway work and it can then go towards all the long-term improvements. So if we're going to add turn lanes, we'll make sure those turn lanes are in the pro proper location so that when we come back and pave, those turn lanes will now become a shoulder. Or if we add a, a median, that that lane can now become a, a second eastbound lane. So we want to avoid throwaway work. We don't want to just check a box saying we did something. So we're very being um, uh, purposely deliberate in, in making sure that when we get to the point to uh, plan and design, that we are doing so responsibly. So the, the, the money goes towards the longer term need of, the, of whatever corridor we're talking about. Exactly, good yeah, point. Very good, good point. very good. Right. <clears throat> because both of these projects are on the PPRTA three list. Correct. <clears throat> um, Eastonville, McLaughlin to Bandanero and Highway 105 from Furrow to Arrowwood. That's the other side of 83, isn't it? So there's, there's a little bit of overlap in that segment. I think it's it overlaps segment B in the RTA 2 project list. And that was, again, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, like you mentioned, uh, the Eastonville Road project is an RTA 3 from Laughlin to Bandanero. So the thought is, at the very least, if we could design and maybe... Um, install the curb and gutter, and we can come back in with the A-list RTA-3 project and complete a design that's already been done. So that'll be, I mean, I know the industry likes the term shovel-ready. Well, have a shovel-ready project that January 1st, 25, we can jump in and start working on. Okay, good. All right. Great. But uh, just an FYI for the CAC and the board, so this, these two projects and pro potentially others are going to complicate the definition of completely funded, which is further down on the agenda. And you had a comment? Well, I just have a, another little question. Um, is on this project, is it also a consideration about acquiring property and uh, complying with EPA standards and all those things that make it slow? <laughs> so that I just wondered. Well, and not only that those items are included, but that also has an effect upon the cost of the projects also. Mm -hmm. So uh, whenever Josh or um, the city is doing these type of projects, you know, they have to take all that into consideration. Mm -hmm. And this goes what? back to what uh, Rick said a few minutes ago in PPRTA 2 was that, uh, you know, some of the numbers that they had were very sketchy and mm -hmm. I don't believe included in a lot of the detail. Well, I know they didn't include a lot of the detail that uh, results in some of the costs for these projects. Well, that's true. I mean, everything's going up, including the price of land and regulations. So 
Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, Brandy. I just, this is my first quarterly report. So I wanted to say thank you to the county and the city and the other jurisdictions, but clearly you guys have done the brunt of the work. So it's very good to have all this information in one place. And like Jim said, I think we'll be referencing it for at least months to come. So thank your staff for all the hard work that they've put in because I was counting and I thought a hundred pages, my goodness, that's the word. So thank you. And then not, and Rick, you probably know the answer to this back to um, 105. Does it have to be construction or can it be design that they do in that stretch? And if it is one or the other, can it then be determined that it's completely funded? before we get to 12. Good question. I will ask the attorney and report back next month. I, I'm I'm guessing construction, but uh, I'll check with the attorney. All right, good discussion. Um, and uh, I think it was uh, informative for everyone. So thank you. All right, let's move on um, to item 8A, report of board actions. Uh, it's a, in your packet. It's kind of a summary of the board meeting uh, last month. Uh, any comments or questions by anybody on that one? Rick, you got anything you need to add? Okay. Uh, let's go to 8B, uh, Board Policy 32, defined completely funded. Um, I'll let Rick kick this off, but um, before he does, um, the board was okay uh, with the process that we were taking, um, the deliberate process of, of going through this and working through it. Uh, they agreed it wasn't time sensitive. And so um, here, here we are, Rick. So um, I think we're shooting for June. I think the, that Gail and Josh would appreciate knowing what this policy says by June for your beginning your uh, budget planning for 2024. So that's, that's our time Sooner goal. The better. <laughs> Uh, that is correct. Okay. Um, so, uh, as you recall, the, the, the CAC uh, postponed this last month and uh, gave CAC members uh, an opportunity uh, for a couple of weeks for input. I, I did receive uh, an email from Mr. McPadden that's in your packet. Uh, I liked his, his uh, format for um, a list, so I adopted the list format for the lower half of the page. Um, so again, this th doesn't have to be decided today, but um, um, Gail and Josh have uh, seen it in this new format and they're okay with it, uh, but it's up for discussion. Um, and as you recall last month, uh, Scott Barnhart asked the question about the worst case scenario is, the change order after change order after change order, and then we just run out of uh, out of money through all the steps. Um, so I've added those <clears throat> um, sequential steps, um, and with the worst case scenarios uh, being towards the bottom of uh, the last few items in the list of seven. So um, available for discussion. I have a, just a quick question on the end. So it specifically calls out um, the 2.5 million in the 2023 budget and then capital funding authorizing 2025. Would this, this then be kind of revamped in the future? Do we want a policy that's universal or are we just gonna put it in place and then 10 years from now, we'll put in a new policy? Uh, so, since it's very answer, the policy is actually written for future cases. Those are examples. Are you going to leave them in the final draft? It was for the purpose of identifying what the calculation meant. And maybe it should be prefaced with example. Yeah. yeah. Semicolon. Uh, right. I think that would be helpful. Open for uh, uh, flexible on that. I, I just wanted to uh, show some examples, uh, but we can delete those or say uh, that they are examples. Okay. But and it might be going forward uh, useful um, to leave example in there for someone else reading it uh, that they could refer back to. Uh, the example can always be changed if it's something more relevant, but that, that may help it a little understand.
Any comments from anybody? I have a comment. Go ahead, Tony, and then Greg. Um, I, I guess one of the problems I have with this is the fact, like, um, as an example, and this is not an accusation or anything of sort, but on the uh, Highway 105 thing that we were just talking about, without having a scope that was set out in the first place, how do we uh, how do we come up with that? Because if the scope can change, and say they uh, say that the county, for instance. Uh, for example, this is just an example. This is not um, what's happening, I understand. But they say that, well, you know what? We want to make it four lanes all the way, and it's not funded until we have that. Now everybody else is on the hook to make that happen before they can move on to their capital, uh, onto their project B list. Um, that seems like without having a little more structure on what that means to have a have it fully funded, I, I don't know any of this, uh, that any of this makes a whole heck of a lot of sense without knowing exactly what that scope is beforehand. And we don't do that when we go to the voters. We don't have that scope on there when we go to the voters. So how do we define that scope after the fact when the actual money's starting to change hands? Um, well, m my first comment would be that um, you're right the scope of projects evolves as they get closer to design and execution and that kind of thing. But it's somewhat also constrained, isn't it? Member governments is somewhat constrained by your annual allotment and what you're getting and the percentage of your deal. So you've got to build to that. Right. That's my point though, is it needs to be constrained by that. But when we say, okay, now the now all the other member governments are going to be on the hook, they can't go to their their uh B list until every other member government has their A list funded. Well, now it now there is no constraint on their uh, on their allotment anymore. Now they can say, well, uh, you know, Colorado Springs cough up some money because we don't have enough to finish ours in the county. That's a possibility. Anybody, yeah, I, I, again, this is just the one example. Yeah, yeah that's that's the the struggle that, and and Rick and I have talked a little bit about this. That's the struggle as we as we approach the final year or so of this uh, is maintaining that balance and equity. Um, but at the same time, this is a regional program. And this is this is what makes me a little uncomfortable with this new concept versus the pool thing that we had before. Not that this is bad. I'm just comfortable with the pool because that's what we did before. So I'm I'm not saying that it's good, bad, or indifferent. But the idea the to me, as we're looking at the execution of the 23 and the increased costs that are experienced through fiscal year 23. And as we go into the formulation of the 24 budget, it's a balancing act. Yes, you've got your quota and yes, you've got your allocation. Um, but what we don't want is somebody going spending the money because they have it on something that Another another entity needs to complete an important project. So it's that balancing that heretofore hadn't. It, it's not necessary year to year during the middle of the of the thing, but it becomes important in the end to balance it out so that we don't have that total financial imbalance between between agencies. And that's where I think it gets tough in the final year as we're putting together the budget and as scopes are defined some of the scopes if i understand josh right a lot of the scope on c through e is going to be driven by the cost in a and b and then i'll say all right i got this long list of things that need to be done but in reality i can only get the first 10 of them but at least i can get something all the way to the end and I, that's the that's the hard part for the staff that have to make the decisions. In in my opinion, Gail. 
Uh, Mr. Gregory and then Josh may want to jump in. I have two things. One, um, to kind of address maybe the issue Josh was talking about in that concept, if you have a larger corridor, again, we don't know some of the scope up front. So one of the early things that we end up doing, you know, traffic analysis, doing the planning. So we may identify improvements that might be as simple as uh, shoulder improvements or just inter spot intersection improvements that can provide the overall intent of what improvements on that corridor would be through that early planning process. Um, so that's one, but the biggest thing I wanted to, to jump in on, even with the definition of this policy for 32 for completely funded, I actually don't think it changes the pool concept that you mentioned. Um, the allocations we get every year for an annual basis are used for planning. And when we are ready to move to the B list, you know, we're still going to be, staff would be providing recommendations to the CAC and board, but ultimately it's going to be the prioritization on, on what would be funded in the B list because the B list is so voluminous, right? And they may choose to break them off where each jurisdiction is going to get funding towards a project or, um, or pick one larger project, which I've, we've heard discussions about in the past. So I don't think the pool concept changes. This just happens if you move forward, what the steps would be if you found yourself in, in, uh, in a pickle, let's say. All right, thanks for clarifying that. I, I think you would, as we get closer to B and the possibility of reaching B increases, I, I agree with Gail's last statement is I think we may get some guidance as to which project on the B list we all focus the rest of our money on. And we can all guess what that project might be, but um, <laughs> but um, we heretofore we haven't really gotten a lot of direction in terms of priorities on projects. But I could see that coming as we transition to the B list um, uh, because of the, the political implications of not doing it um, for some people. So anyway, other comments, uh, Craig? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, first of all, I appreciate that we put this off last month so that. I had an opportunity to chew on it and talk to some people about it. Um, the feedback that I got uh, from the folks in our little town um, is that the requirements to determine what is adequate funding um, uh, was kind of onerous uh, for us in terms of, you know, getting the opinions of the probable construction costs and contingencies and shovel ready and so forth. Um, relative to the amount that we're getting, that chews up a lot of the money that is available for our projects. Um, and I, I think that that uh, kind of uncovers another thing that I think is a little bit larger here. And that, that is that we're setting this up after we have gone through PPRTA3 and, and defined what our A projects are going to be for that. Uh, I think if this had been available prior to that, you might have seen a different list or maybe a shorter list uh, from us based on what these requirements are. So I feel like maybe the the horse got uh, behind the cart a little bit in this case. Okay. So, Craig, my understanding, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is this is for closing out PPRTA 2, and hopefully it's not completely ruining your PPRTA3 lists, but I want to ask that to make sure we're all on the same page. Well, I, my assumption, and yeah. that's all it is, is that this is, you know, going forward, this is how we're going to define fully funded. And that was not my understanding, so I would love some clarification. So this was intended for the closeout of a 10-year authorization. So in this case, the focus, we're writing it now, would be how you would shift to the B list for PPRTA two. Okay. Right? And, and I think what you're talking about is when we went through the planning process with our allocation to develop our list. And I, I don't really see these things, these either of these things do the same thing. Because it was a, if you recall we had, was it 80, I can't even remember the percentage right. we ended up, it's like 83% of the projected revenue is what we were all, based on our population, what we were all given for planning for RTA three. And that would not be any different than what uh, what is being proposed here with this money for the A list? I'm sorry, the, the cutoff between the A and B list. Okay, so what I'm looking at here, am I understanding that this does not apply to projects for PPRTA3, or is this it, going to be in it, effect? It would, it would apply for RTA3, but we would be talking 10 years from now. Well, we would still have to go through this process for all the projects, all of our A projects, to consider them fully funded. No, 
Okay, no, what am I what am I missing? Not, not during not the execution. PPRTA3. So this is so we can close out PPRTA two and we're right. comfortable with the B list. And then PPRTA three goes back to business as usual until we get to ten years from now, and then this policy would then come into play again. So it's really when you get to the end and you want to move to B list. As long as you're not planning on moving to the B list, this policy does not come into effect. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's only when you're getting to the end yes. that you have to worry about. Correct. Okay. Yes. So yes. this should I'm not put undue burden on your municipality. Okay. My my understanding was that this was the expectation of no, no. for every single project. No, you're you're okay for PPRTA three until you get to the end. But I would say because you guys are more nimble, the faster you can get your projects going for PPRTA three, that's to your advantage because then you don't even have to worry about this. Good point. All right. Thank you. That helps. And this policy could be modified anytime in the 10 year cycle of PPRTA three. So yeah, the 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 hundred percent focus right now is the end of PPRTA two. Any other comments or questions? What do you want to do? You wanna take this and mull on it again and, and bring it up next month? Or do you want to go forward with this as a draft or recommendation? I make a motion that we recommend it to the board. Okay. So we have, a for those online, uh, Brandy, make it a recommendation to present this outline to the board. Um, looking for a second. I would second that. Dave Zellenock, second. Um, any discussion, any further discussion? Who's got a number here? I'm still not comfortable with it. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott says he's comfortable with it. Um, Craig? Yeah, I'd, I'd really like to share the clarifications I just got with the folks in our government. Okay. Well, we have a motion. We have a motion and a second on the floor to go forward. Rick's checking. Rick's checking Robert's rules. So give us just a second to <laughs> dig up Robert's rules of orders here. <laughs> we don't want Lisa getting upset. I read this and understood it. I thought I thought it was pretty straightforward. We fixed the example thing. Um, um, I think it's a lot. This lot is Cindy. Go ahead, Cindy. Yeah, if we have a motion and a second on the table, someone can call for a vote. And I mean, if it fails, it fails. But can't we just call for a vote? That's one option. There's one person that would like to have it postponed. And Rick's checking to see if a postpone an op postpone a override overrides going for a vote. So. Cindy, I'm not sure you heard that. Uh, it's it seems that uh, a postponement motion would uh, take precedence over the motion I seconded that's on the floor if it gets a second to the motion. Otherwise, well, first off, is there a fir is there a first motion to postpone? Yes, I move to postpone this till next month. This is Anne, and I second it. That was that was yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's the precedence. Go on the postponement first. Okay. All right. So we have two motions. One is to go forward, one is to postpone. We'll, we'll vote on the postpone 
uh, taking it forward first. So um, I'd like for you, those that are online, um, put your hand up like you got to ask a question, your yellow thing, so we can count it. And we'll we'll do it this way rather than do a roll call. Uh, those in the room, all those in favor of postponing, say aye. I mean, raise, raise your hand, sorry. So we have two in the room, and Ann, you've got yours up, and Richard, you got yours up. Am I reading that right? Yep, that's correct. Okay, so we have four people to postpone. Um, so I guess the next one would be on I want people to vote to go forward. So those willing to uh, go forward, um, do the same thing. We'll raise our hand and say aye or raise your hands. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry to be difficult, but don't we have to, on that motion of postponing, don't we have to have a full vote, those who oppose and those who, oh, and then okay. either- I'm sorry, you're correct, yes. Vote. You're correct, I'm correct, you're, you're correct, Cindy. All those opposed to postponing, raise your hand. Okay, so we got one, two, Three, four, five, six. And Cindy, you're postponed or not? We are. I thought oh, I raised well, my you're hand. You're up. Okay, and Cindy. Not. And that includes Bruce Colson, too. He's here. Okay. So that's two. So that's two. So the vote to postpone failed. Back to the main motion. So we go back to the main motion. Um, and I, we'll come back to your concern um, in just a second. Um, so, um, all those in favor of taking this as a initial recommendation to the board, raise your hand. Uh, all those opposed? We have three opposed and, uh, and the rest of them are four. Now, is your concern, Craig, about just addressing and educating on the clarification that this doesn't apply to the normal execution? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the motion passes, we'll take this forward, but I think we can address your concern um, before the board for you uh, so that you can educate those folks going mm -hmm. forward. Okay, uh, obviously. I, I voted for postponement too, so isn't that for? Yeah. We saw your hand, Ann, thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so the motion carries, we'll take this forward. Um, and then um, I, I think that your concern about um, it applying only to the closeout year, so to speak, can probably be addressed yeah. during the during the memo in the recommendation to clarify that in the language and i can certainly make that clear going forward because we've got new board members as well okay um would that make sense with everybody i like that um and so we'll we'll try to cover that concern that way if that's all right okay all right good meeting good discussion um, anybody have any burning issues, agenda items for next meeting? Okay, anybody online? Nothing major? All right, seeing none. Um, communications, anybody have anything that's not CAC related that you want to share with the other members? Other than it's getting close to, never mind. Um, <laughs> All right, seeing none, um, then I have a motion to hear a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn the meeting. Larry, second. Rick, Rick all those in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you all very much for your time and hard work. I really appreciate it.